NFO program number one, Q. Welcome to another program of the U.S. Farm Report brought to you by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area in the interest of agricultural, private enterprise, business, and the welfare of our nation. How do you do? I am E.W. Mueller, Secretary of Church and Town and Country of the National Lutheran Council with offices in Chicago. To my left is Louis Almain, a Christian Division of uh, Philosophy and Religion, Augustana College, Rock Island, Illinois. And to his left is John Dickens, pastor of Wallen Methodist Church, north of Fort Wayne. And on my far left is Edward W. O'Rourke, Executive Director of the National Catholic Rural Life Conference, with the address at 3801 Grand Avenue, Des Moines, Iowa. We are all interested in the things that are happening in town and country. We have definite concerns and different views, which we would like to discuss with you this afternoon or uh, today. The, uh, as we move around in the country, we discover that there is much uncertainty among people who make up the rural sector. And by the rural sector, we mean not just farm people, we mean the people living in our small towns or open country areas and perhaps the agricultural business centers up to about 10,000. And that people hold many different views. They have conflicting views as to the future of rural society. What are some of the things that you uh, are doing, Father O'Rourke, or as you see the problem from where you operate and where you work? Dr. Mueller, I agree with your observation that rural America includes the town as well as the people out on the farm. But I would like to begin my observations by pointing to the fact that we have in America a very special kind of agriculture. We call it the family type agriculture. The farming in this nation is carried out by and for farm families in almost all instances. Now this has proved the most efficient way of produ producing food and fiber the world has ever known. And there are also many social and religious advantages enjoyed by the family where the family works together on a family enterprise which is uh, uh, of an agricultural sort. So many of us in religious organizations and many uh, people out on the farm and in farm organizations are exceedingly anxious to preserve this kind of agriculture. However, we see a peril to this kind of agriculture in the fact that during the last 15 years, income of family farmers in this nation has not kept pace with that of people in other occupations. Any way you uh, estimate the uh, reasonable returns to farmers for what they produce, we must conclude that here and now, farmers are not getting the kind of income they need. This means that by degrees, the capital investment of these families in their farm enterprise is being er eroded. The support that the family on the farm needs is inadequate. This begins to show itself in the kind of living condition, education, and other opportunities a farm family enjoys. So I am here today with you other men to uh, express concern about the income of farmers and perhaps eventually to propose ways and means in which we might improve this income. I think you have made a, a good statement there. I would say, uh, Father Rourke, that everybody sort of agrees that the family farm is a good institution. We ought to preserve the family farm. And they also, uh, however, they differ as to what is happening. Some say the family farm is sounder today than it ever was. We get less units, but we get a stronger unit. But where the real conflict comes in, I think, is in the area of, of the method that you're going to use to uh, preserve the family-type farm. Some would rely heavily on government. Others say that that's not the answer at all. Others would like to do it themselves. And others say, just let things go and it'll work out itself. Now, what do you think on this, Lewis? Do you think that we can just let the thing ride? Or will the problem go away? Or, or uh, are we just sort of kidding ourselves or getting involved in things that we ought not to be involved in? I don't believe the problem is going to go away. 
Uh, many problems do solve themselves in the passage of time, but I don't believe this is one of those problems. My concern with uh, rural life uh, is a concern basically with people representing an educational institution. We are primarily concerned with the development of people. Now, I am convinced that the only way in which this can be done is by people working together. Now, this implies the cooperation of uh, the people in the community, their own collective action, the development of uh, community spirit and community collaboration. But since we are part of a larger community, it implies also that we are willing uh, to take advantage of the special resources that lie outside of the local community, including government and including uh, also the, uh, the um, organizations, national organizations, in this instance, the national farm organizations that uh, seek to better the lot of uh, the individual farmer and thereby better the community. Now, pastor Dickon, you're a pastor of a parish, and you are probably closer to the grassroots than most of us in your day-to-day -day activities. Do you find that the people who are on the farm and who operate the farms and the people that are uh, on Main Street, let us say, of a small town, are they beginning to get closer together, or do they still think in terms of their own interests? How do you find it, and do you find this tension in any way in your congregation? I think I represent a very unique uh, position on this panel today, because only six months ago I was in a small town, pastor of a small church, and uh, today I find myself in a suburb of Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, I think I can sense, begin, begin to sense at least now, something of the tremendous difference of the orientation of a small town from those who are in suburban life. And from my experience back in the small town from which I came, I discover that persons are aware now more than ever of the fact that there are some community problems that they're going to have to tackle together. But as I see it, the basic uh, problem for them is uh, we're not used to this kind of working together. We've been so self-sufficient and independent, working things out on our own, that uh, we really don't, uh, don't know how to uh, get hold of the problem together. We, we've solved many of our problems individually, but we can't tackle this community problem uh, as a group. So we're sort of in a, moving into a different era, aren't we? And the fact is, in the past, we could talk about farm problems more or less by themselves and about the problems of the small town. But I think, the, and today, since the farmers represent a very small segment of our population, if my figures are correct, I believe that about one-fourth of the people living in town and country areas or the small town are, are farmers. So we have three-fourths of the people who make up a rural population who really don't directly get their livelihood from the land. I think it's a matter of bringing these interest groups together. And I've sensed that people have a, a, a real sense of frustration. Often they feel things, but, but they uh, don't have an, the opportunity or the ability to sort of to articulate their real needs. And do you see any hope, any possibility of getting these people who represent the farmers, or the actual operators now, I mean, the ones that produce our food and fiber, and the people who live in our small towns who provide the services, like the bankers, the implement dealers, the garage mechanics, getting these people to really begin to see that they are a part of the same one uh, problem. How do you feel, uh, how do you see that, uh, Father Rourke? I have noticed as I travel about the nation and visit with various groups that there is a growing awareness on the part of many of our townspeople that the uh, problem of the farmer is their problem as well. However, the uh, re realization that this is their problem and even the will to do something about it has to be further strengthened with the right kind of organizational tool to get the job done. Now, part of the confusion lay in the fact that the low income of the farmer can be best corrected by farmers through their own farm organizations, whereas some of these problems that affect the whole community can very often be solved on a community-wide or county-wide basis with tools such as rural areas development committees and such. I think sometimes people feel that if they uh, commit themselves to one kind of organizational tool, somehow they must resist any participation in the other. For example, I can see how a farmer might consider his prime loyalty in the way of farm organizations to the farm organization of his choice through which he can 
perhaps bargain for a better price and improve the income of himself and other farmers. I can see, how, uh, however, that there may be need in the community of which he's a part for a community-wide or a county-wide committee, such as Rural Areas Development or perhaps an anti-poverty committee, in which he as a citizen of that community ought to be a part. Now, when you look at the merchant in the town, he certainly would have interest in the community or countywide committee, but he might have cause to give some support to the farm organization that represent most of his clients, because as the welfare of his clients go, so also will go his business and his future in the community. I'd also yeah. suggest uh, an example of uh, community in which the concern for community-wide endeavor actually started in one congregation, which uh, held a year-long emphasis on Sunday mornings in its Bible class on this community under God, in which it studied the history and so on, geologic background of the community, finally got up to the welfare services, uh, the uh, land planning needs, and so on. And out of this grew uh, a, a community-wide program to deal with community needs. Presently, they're tackling um, uh, the development of a, uh, a med medical clinic. Now, uh, this is a, uh, a way in which the church has provided an initial spark, a catalytic uh, beginning for a community-wide endeavor that brought together people from various farm organizations also into a community endeavor. And it uh, uh, provided the means through which the whole community was able to work together, including farm organizations. I think these are good experiences, and I think we can uh, have demonstrations and have a, that rural people can work together on such things as a better a new hospital or uh, yes. this type of thing, which is sort of a general interest. But I constantly hear this comment made by a lot of people that you just can't organize farmers from the standpoint of uh, getting them to work together when it involves their own economic well-being. For instance, uh, they will belong to their organizations and they will support their organizations, they will have their own insurance companies, and this type of thing. But uh, I think there's some real question in the minds of people, whether or not they will really stick with one another when it comes to their own individual income. So that if, what I'm trying to get at is here, is here they have a certain group loyalty, and they create a, a certain structure, like uh, Father Rourke mentioned, that they need a structure to work through. They need a structure to work through in order to, to deal with marketing. But now when it comes to being loyal to the group that re represents a certain structure, see, or being loyal to their own interest, at this point I think uh, that the farmer is his own problem. Have you observed any of this, or do you think that, uh, that the farmer has the capacity, or that farmers as such have the capacity to really get together and form an organization that they will stick with when the going gets tough? I think uh, the problem is that uh so many of our people in our, our uh, rural communities have never really had a chance to sit down in, a, in an intermixed group. That is, so often they, they meet uh, with other farmers or uh, uh, they meet with those who belong to the same Grange or, or some other group. And they don't mix themselves in very frequently with persons who represent other viewpoints. So as a, as a result, we really don't have communication. And I think communication is going to be the key here until they really know that this other fellow has needs, too, and maybe we'll never get the problems tackled. May I suggest, too, that uh, the pastor in the parish has a very important role to play here, in my estimation. This problem that you described, Dr. Mueller, is, in the last analysis, a question of social responsibility and loyalty, which is a religious and moral responsibility, if I understand it rightly. So if the religious life and the church activity and the motivation that's drawn from religion is uh, pertinent and strong and really related to daily life, we will be injecting into these farm organizations and community organizations a kind of people that will be prepared to do their part. However, when we turn again to the farm organizations, we must note that even the most loyal and dedicated individual in the world if they find that repeatedly their uh, efforts to promote the common good uh, fail to accomplish the goal that they intended and that they as individuals end up handicapped rather severely economically and otherwise, then they just simply have to judge that as of now they have not yet the kind of organizational tool that will make their goodwill and their generosity and their loyalty and their social consciousness bear fruit. The two have to come together. 
There has to be simultaneously in rural America a vital sort of pertinent religious life that will motivate them, and there has to be a kind of effective, broad, down-to-earth organizational tool that will enable them to accomplish their goals. Well, I think some of the groups, and perhaps the church itself, is uh, encouraging an attitude, see, which, is, which, is the, which, which hurts the problem, or hurts the concern. I mean, the attitude of uh, being a strong individual person, standing up, handling your own problems, that you don't need any outside help, see. And this type of thing uh, contributes to people not wanting to really work together. And I think this can be traced back to some of our history. And I would say some of our churches, maybe many of the Protestant churches, have contributed to this. What I'm trying to say is this, that some of our value, basic values were laid down in the uh, days of the Puritans in New England. This was standing on your own feet, rugged individualism, and uh, a strong individual responsibility. Then these values were carried westward, and they became the... Uh, sort of the basis on which many of our small communities were laid out and that began to influence the thinking of people in these small communities. And I think the school teacher from New England and the uh, editor from New England or Pennsylvania contributed to this. And about the time that the Middle West was settled, you see, people came from Western Europe. And at that time, the pietism, mm. which emphasizes individual salvation, individual concern, and the hymns that were written during that time always used a personal pronoun. I know that my Redeemer lives up. My faith looks up to thee, you see, this type of thing, and, uh, which is good. I'm not against this, see. But we didn't particularly equally emphasize social responsibility. Now, what we're really having, we're having people who have the capacity to accomplish things as individuals. But this particular period in history, we need individuals who have the capacity, see, to work with other individuals of different views and different opinions. And at this point, you see, we, we don't get this. And this is why when you have one organization pushing a certain program, you can get such a terrible clash of personalities. Now, how can we get over this? Or, uh, well, I think that uh, there has been a change in theology, both Catholic and Protestant theology on this, uh, mainly uh, uh, during the age of the 30s, uh, when there was a realization that responsibility meant community-mindedness, not simply individual initiative. And I think this change has occurred in, in ethics. Uh, it hasn't necessarily occurred in the folk culture. And I think one of the things that the church needs to do is to indicate that responsibility can mean different things in different eras. Today it means community-mindedness and, and responsibility in that sense. It occurs to me also that the pastor in a rural community can find himself in a rather mm -hmm. delicate position in this. He may find in some instances that Members of his parish are very avidly supporters of one farm organization and others very avidly opposing that farm organization or perhaps supporting another. Now, the first tendency, I suppose, is to say, well, I'll keep out of this and I'll say nothing, which leads very often to a failure on the part of the pastor to do his part to, to help the people relate their religion to the real big issues of their daily affairs. And if religion doesn't pertain to something like this, upon which the very continuation of the family-type farm and sometimes the very survival of the family and of the community depend, well, then you may ask, well, well, how pertinent is religion to life at all? The other extreme, and I've seen this happen too, for a pastor, perhaps foolishly, to come out definitely and specifically for one farm organization rather than for another, for one particular technique of solving the problem rather than the other, an area in which he may not be as well informed as some of those whom he is counseling, and this can harm the church and can harm the movement. I don't think any farm organization wants of the pastor a solution of problems of this sort, but he does want an understanding. He does want a concern. He does want to help to motivate and to, to strengthen the kind of, of inner resource that's needed to get the job done. I think you're putting your finger on a point right here is that Pick from the standpoint, as I have contact with pastors, just to know what role they should play. And I think the counsel that you're giving here is, is, is well taken. That we, at least as my view is this, that I don't identify with any particular one farm organization. But I would encourage my members to belong to a farm organization of their choice. Yes, Pastor Dickens. Uh, isn't it important for the pastor to accept leadership in a local church and community? 
at this level of trying to stimulate the leadership of the church to begin to recognize that here is an ideal place where we can have an open forum discussion of some of the things that matter the most. Now, they may not be uh, theologically mm -hmm. uh, the kind of problem that we've been taught to, uh, to deal with within the life of the church, but really, uh, can we not, uh, as pastors, begin to say to our uh, local congregations, look, uh, we have an ideal spot here in the community. Uh, let's come together in the name of Christ and s look at this problem together. Isn't this a part of his leadership? This, I think, would be very uh, a good approach. Now, we run into this, is, and I think here we need to develop our lay people so that lay people can uh, differ with somebody else violently without getting angry at that person. See, I may differ with your views, with your opinions, mm -hmm. but I respect you as a person. But I think real people sometimes, because of a lack of maturity, don't have the capacity to disassociate a man's opinion from, from him as a person. So if they don't like his particular uh, method of solving the farm problem, they get angry at him rather at the, getting angry at the idea. Now, is it possible uh, in our pastoral ministry, uh, Louis, to begin to deal with this? Well, I think it is very definitely possible, and it has the encouragement of uh, both Roman Catholic and Protestant theology. I remember that uh, in the 1890s, Pope Leo and his social encyclicals uh, began an encouragement of vocational groups to meet together to discuss their problems. And this, of course, is part of a Protestant approach to vocation as well, that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Christian should be concerned about the way in which he lives out uh, his faith in daily life. And uh, this, in fact, is uh, the, the basic design of his life. The, the lay people um, in both uh, communions uh, are uh, encouraged, therefore, by their groups to um, do this very thing, to discuss the basic problems that they have together from the point of view of, of the Christian faith. But this means, that in order to do this, that uh, the pastor, with some of his preaching, perhaps, is going to have to center down on some of the more human frailties of us all in terms of our uh, lack or inability to communicate. And he may have to begin to get uh, pretty personal. Will we just get him into trouble? We run into the difficulty here, though, that, that, that the fact that when he starts doing this, that some people will call him, say, he's meddling, he's getting into things that doesn't concern the preacher. See? And I think, therefore, I think we need to uh, sort of... Uh, prepare the pastor for it. I think we're going to have to prepare our lay people for this, that this is nothing, something new to the church. The church has always had concern for the problems of day-to-day -day living. We sometimes in the past may have not spelled this out very precisely, but I think this is what we're trying to do in some of the context that we have. And I think uh, Father Work is working on this very intensely in some of his works. I would like to add now, I think our comments about the role of the pastor and the farmer and the other community leaders is all well taken. But I can hear now some of the farmers saying to me, as they've said often in the past, we have tried this at our local community, but our problems go much beyond the uh, area over which we have direct control. And this is correct in a very real sense. So we're often asked, well, what is the possibility of more cooperation and unity among the several farm organizations? And Dr. Mueller, you and I and others have from time to time had dialogue with the leaders of national farm organizations, and not infrequently, they throw the ball right back to the local community, pointing out with some justification that there is presently more unity and dialogue and communication among the leaders of the great farm organizations than there are among the rank and file members of those same organizations back in our parishes and our communities. Both have to happen together you will not have really effective cooperation on these big issues by the farm organizations if the rank and file member isn't prepared for it and isn't willing to support it and to, uh, to uh, lend a, a certain amount of encouragement to it. So while we who are in charge of certain aspects of national uh, church uh, farm related organizations communicate with those who are leaders of national organizations, the pastors like you, uh, Reverend Dickens, who are related a little more closely to the people, the grassroots, you have your task to do also. I do feel, however, that we're coming closer to an answer. There's a great ferment going on, and I think that out of it all, we will find an answer soon. 
I think we need in this, I think we're, uh, we're talking pretty much about the farm problem, and I think the farm problem is pretty much basic to our sound rural economy, because most of our rural communities, particularly in the Midwest, are pretty much oriented to a farm economy. And if the farm economy is sound, they'll all benefit. But I do think that we also have to take into consideration the many people here who are not directly involved in farming. And I, I would make the comment, observation, that to my mind, rural America today is voiceless. Who speaks for rural people? As I said, I've talked about the people in the towns of 10,000 and less. If we take the people, for instance, living in the non-metropolitan counties, and this includes counties that have no, pop no city above 50,000, if we just take the towns of 10,000 and less in open country, we come up with a total population of about 70 million people. These are what I refer to as the rural sector. Now, who speaks for them? I would say today they're voiceless. We have four farm organizations, but as we've indicated earlier, there's only about one-fourth of this group is far, uh, related to farm, farming as such. Now, we have this other vast group. Now, somehow, I think there's needed today, and how it's going to be done, that the various organizations to which, in which these people are, are working, or to which they belong, that they somehow begin to have communication, as you earlier said, Pastor Dickon, that they begin to share views, and that they see that they're in this together. Because if the interests are fragmented, see, here, here are the little towns, they have their interests. Here are the business people, they have their interests, you see. How can this group begin to uh, get a voice? Don't you think a, a part of the problem is that we've had a discussion up here on the top floor and we've had discussion down here on the bottom floor, but nobody's been running up and down the staircase? And what we need to do is to begin to get uh, local people where they feel like they're in at the national level. And national people to feel like they know the real problem down at the local level. It's got to be this way too, doesn't yeah, it? Right. But you see, this uh, is where I have my frustrations. The fact that, now here's rural development, community development. See, we say, this is a good program, but it won't get off to a first base unless local people take the initiative. Now, how do you get local people to take the initiative? You see, if you come in from the outside, well, then you're, it's a, uh, a federal-oriented program. You see. But here, I think we do have a, I think we're beginning to get in at the, the real issue here, but how can we have local people take the leadership and yet give them the information without beginning to dominate the program? See, this is a, Father Ark? It would seem to me that these uh, great changes of a social and economic sort take time. The Rural Areas Development Program is about four years old. And in that time, 2,200 counties have formed these broadly based uh, community action committees. This is good. When you stop to think that in just a few years ago, each little community was pretty much on its own in all of its planning and all of its educational and industrial development and similar projects. Now, uh, Dr. Mueller, the thing that you asked for, do we have anything in sight that would truly be a voice for all of rural America, town and country alike? On a national basis, I say I can't see it yet. Perhaps from this rank and file grassroots swell of rural development, uh, anti poverty, and similar uh, committees, which are broadly based and represent town and country equally well, I think, at the local level, maybe someday from that we'll get a, a national voice. It may well be that the great farm organization will be a very integral part, but it'll be very hard at present to predict which way we will develop. This possibility that the redistricting that is uh, occurring in many legislatures will bring about uh, an awareness on the part of uh, rural people that they are a minority now and that uh, they need to be very self-conscious uh, of themselves. This might bring about the awareness from which the voice then will proceed. See, I think this is the point that's new today. Up to now, rural, uh, the rural people have had a sort of a political majority. Mm -hmm. But now we're moving into an area where rural people are definitely a minority group, a minority sector. And uh, they now have to discover how can they play this minority role, play it intelligently and in a responsible way. Not just concerned for the well-being of rural people and the small town people, but they're going to play it responsibly. They're going to have to do it for the whole nation. Well, it's been real good visiting with you people this afternoon. And I hope you and your home communities will discuss some of these issues that we've tried to raise, even if we've discussed them here. Good afternoon.
This program is brought to you by members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area in the interest of agriculture, private enterprise business, and the welfare of our nation.